Hello and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us for today's policy briefing, the state of US-Japan economic relations, what's working and what's needed. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we start. Um, today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be available on the Sasakawa USA website in the coming weeks. And uh, regarding the Q&A session that we will have later in the program, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function, uh, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And uh, please feel free to submit those questions at any time throughout the program. So I would like to briefly introduce our three distinguished speakers that we have with us here today. Uh, first, we have Mr. Kenichiro Mizoguchi, General Manager, Washington DC Office of Hitachi Limited. And next, we have Mr. Shinsuke Takahashi, Chairman of the Board and Head of Government Relations of NEC Corporation of America. And last but not least, Ms. Misato Kogure, Director, Business Development and Environmental Affairs of Daiking U.S. Corporation. I will now turn over the program to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa USA. Dr. Akimoto, yoroshiku onegaitashimasu. Good afternoon from Washington, D.C. It is great to see everybody. My name is Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I am your host today. There's no doubt that Washington and Tokyo both feel pretty good about their bilateral relationship. The Biden administration has been successfully rebuilding relationship with the traditional allies. And Japan is the biggest ally of the United States in the Asia Pacific. The Biden administration has systematically approached the Suga cabinet in Tokyo, beginning with the bilateral phone call with the Prime Minister Suga, followed by the two plus two meeting in Tokyo, which both Secretary of State Blinken and the Secretary of Defense Austin attended in person. And of course, summit meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Suga at the White House last month. It was noted that Prime Minister Suga was the very first foreign leader to visit President Biden at the White House in person. The summit covered a wide range of critically important bilateral issues, such as geopolitics and security, technology and innovation, climate change, COVID-19, to name few. However, one thing seems to be missing was economic and business cooperation, such as US getting back into CPTPP, a major free trade agreement from which United States has withdrawn. We have a wonderful panel to discuss an aspect of the United States, Japan, economic and business cooperation, namely Japanese companies investing and operating business in the United States, hiring American people, collaborating with American companies, working with American policymakers, and becoming part of American business and community landscape. All three companies represented today have a major footprint in the United States. Hitachi, represented by Mr. Mizoguchi, has been in the United States for 62 long years. Their business covers a wide range of industrial areas. It is a piece of news in Washington that Hitachi has recently gotten a major contract to provide up to 800 rail cars to Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority. NEC, represented by Mr. Takahashi, is of course a major technology company in the world. The company has industry-leading industry biometrics technology to protect the US and American citizens. NEC also has communication technology, which was mentioned as 5G open run in the joint statement following the Biden-Suga summit. 
Daikin, represented by Ms. Kogure, is a global AC company with environmental views, which is quickly spreading its business footprint in the United States. Daikin has a major investment in Daikin Texas Technology Park outside Houston. And the company is expected to create one of the largest number of jobs in the state of Texas by a single business entity. Each speaker will speak 15 minutes and will open for discussion. So let's begin with Mr. Mizoguchi of Hitachi. Mr. Mizoguchi. Uh, Akimoto-san, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to just comment the Sasakawa USA for the critical work uh, they are doing to build deeper ties between the US and Japan, both in the security and the commercial space. Uh, there is more work to be done, but hopefully today's discussion can help advance it. Next slide, please. My aim today is threefold. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Hitachi and uh, detail how we are transforming key elements of the American economy. I'll then offer my perspective on the current US business climate, working through what is working well and then highlight issues that needed to be addressed. So with that, let's start. Uh, next slide, please. Founded in 1910 and headquartered in Tokyo, Hitachi is a global technology company answering society's critical challenges through cutting edge operational technology, OT, information technology, IT, and products and systems. Uh, the company's consolidated revenue for fiscal year 2020 totaled $78.6 billion, and its 871 companies employ more than 330,000 employees worldwide. At 13% of total revenue, the U.S. represents Hitachi's largest and most important foreign market. Uh, last fiscal year, Hitachi's North American market generated $10.2 billion revenue. Uh, Hitachi has been a com committed American partner since establishing a regional subsidiary in the United States in 1959. Today, Hitachi employs nearly 25,000 US employees across 72 group companies. Uh, next, please. Over the past decade, Hitachi undergone a profound transformation from a consumer electronics giant to a global social innovation business leader. We are primarily a business to business, B2B, and business to government, B2G company, focused on information and infrastructure solutions. In the United States, Hitachi now operates across five business domains, energy, automotive components, industry, rail, and IT. Uh, by focusing on these key segments of the economy, Hitachi is seeking to digitalize American infrastructure, leveraging its deep expertise in OT, IT, and IoT. Uh, let's now take a look at a few key acquisitions and deals. Uh, next, please. Last July, Hitachi acquired 80.1% of ABB's power grid unit in an $11 billion deal. Uh, the newly launched company, uh, Hitachi ABB Power Grids, operates across four domains, uh, grid automation, grid integration, high voltage products, and transformers. Hitachi now serves 80 of uh, the top 100 US power generators. Hitachi ABB Power Grids is working to build a more resilient, flexible, reliable, and efficient grid, and also connect the energy platform to various fields, in, including mobility and industry. Next, please. In December 2019, Hitachi acquired JR Automation in a $1.42 billion deal, a leader in intelligent automated manufacturing, this deal will allow Hitachi to help its customers integrate their physical assets with data information. By connecting the physical and the cyber spaces, Hitachi is helping to digitalize industry. Next, please. 
Itachi is also seeking to acquire Global Logic, a full life cycle product development leader with deep chip to cloud software engineering expertise. With this $9.6 billion acquisition, Hitachi will strengthen its digital platform to create synergies across different sectors and accelerate the digital transformation of social infrastructure at the scale. Uh, next, please. Uh, as Akimoto-san mentioned, uh, in March, uh, the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, UMATA, announced that Hitachi will be designing and building its 8,000 series rail car vehicles. Worth up to $2.2 billion, Hitachi will potentially be able to build up to 800 rail cars. The economic impact of this cannot be overstated, as it will result in a few hundred new jobs and a new manufacturing facility in the Washington capital region. Next, please. So we will look at Hitachi's contribution to the American market. Uh, let's now examine the current US business climate and see if it's working well for Japanese firms. Next, please. First, it's important to note that the US-Japan relations are far more stable today than they have been in the past few decades. Uh, today, we are quite a ways away from Time Magazine warning of Japan's business invasion in 1971. It's hard to imagine law lawmakers today sledgehammering Japanese electronic products as they did in 1987. It helps that in 2019, Japan was the top country for foreign direct investment in the United States. Importantly, US policymakers appreciate Japanese investments in American communities and their embrace of Kaizen or belief that continuous improvement as up to a substantial change over time. Next, please. The US is still an incredibly dynamic and innovative market. A look at BCG's 50 most innovative companies in the world for 2020 shows that the U.S. has 14 of the top 20 spots. Uh, you will see that Hitachi is number 29. Uh, the fields of the future then are being developed in the U.S. And the global policy climate is still being shaped by U.S. firms and public policymakers. And Japanese firms with a presence in the U.S. benefit greatly from this innovation ecosystem. And next, please. The U.S. remains oh, uh, sorry, and the U.S. remains an incredibly pain-free place to conduct business. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, President Trump did not erode America's democratic institutions beyond recognition. America's fair and transparent system cannot be taken for granted. It is central to the U.S. favorite business environment. The United States is also more hospitable to foreign entrants to the domestic market. In the US, an entrepreneur can start a business in a matter of days with the added assurance that their work will be protected by a sound legal system. Next, please. The US also boasts an incredibly proficient and diverse talent pool. Five of the world's uh, top 10 universities and American institutions. U.S. continues to produce world-class research and attract the best and the brightest. While China publishes more AI papers than any other country, the United States still has more cited papers at AI conferences. The U.S. also benefits from its diverse population and immigration system. A 2019 report from the New American Economy shows that 45% of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants or their children, a group that includes Amazon, Apple, Tesla, and Alphabet. Uh, next, please. So that's what is working well. Let's look at what is needed. Uh, next, please. Uh, the United States is desperately in need of an infrastructure overhaul. 
but Democrats and Republicans are currently divided over what infra infrastructure even means. While there is bipartisan consensus that infrastructure investments are needed for the US to keep pace with China and compete globally, there is not a clear vision for the type of investments we need. US policymakers should look beyond the traditional definition of infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, and invest in digitalization of infrastructure. If political consensus is achieved, the US will be able to quickly build the next generation infrastructure the nation needs. Uh, next, please. A whole of society approach is needed to combat climate change. But more importantly, the public and private sectors must position the United States as a climate leader, not just in terms of, in terms of climate target setting, but in pursuing the technologies that will help the global community meet those targets. Companies will not seek to reduce carbon emissions in the supply chains. They are also expected to have significant business opportunities in line with this industrial transformation. Japanese companies should play a central collaborative role in decarbonizing the US economy. Next, please. Federal regulations are not keeping pace with technological progress. And we see this as states have different laws to regulate such as privacy, energy, and autonomous vehicles. Uh, since the California Privacy Rights Act, uh, CPRA, was approved in November 2020, a number of states have considered comprehensive consumer privacy bills. Interest in privacy policy is growing. Uh, however, in the absence of uh, comprehensive federal data privacy law, uh, patchwork of laws exists across states. On the energy side, the 2005 Energy Policy Act designated FERC as the primary authority over power generation across the United States. However, jurisdiction of local level power distribution remains in the hands of state and municipal governments. If we have nationwide power grid, Americans will enjoy a more affordable, efficient, and resilient source of power. Uh, so a consistent federal framework is needed to ensure that the technologies are adopted at the scale and the com companies can treat the US as a single market, not a collection of states with different regulatory systems. Next, please. From national security-based tariffs to the strengthening of SUFIUS, from implementation of the Export Control Reform Act to the Clean Network Initiative, uh, the United States is increasingly viewing economic matters through a national security lens. Fair, clear, and consistent regulations are needed. A uh, speedy and transparent review process should be maintained. And given Japan's status as a trusted US ally, the US should more narrowly apply national security standards to Japanese companies, or even white list them. And Japanese companies should also be actively included in the standardization of next generation technologies. Next, please. President Biden's desire to bolster American competitiveness and protect American jobs is understandable and admirable. Uh, but policies like by American should not be pursued at the expense of greater economic opportunity and innovation. Um, strict by American standards at the initial stage of technology development will negatively impact the American economy and job creation in the longer term. The US should adopt a flexible system that benefits the US economy and American workers by leveraging trusted partnership with allied countries. The US must join Japan to in continuing to defend the liberal economic order. 
Uh, next, please. My last slide. Uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Suga uh, spoke about a global, global partnership for a new era. Uh, and that's the thought I'd like to leave you with today. Um, this is the age of rapid transformation, climate change, digitalization, post-COVID reordering, uh, geopolitical instability, massive infrastructure investment, this is age of challenges and opportunities. And there is a real need for the private sector to lead those changes. Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity for a greater partnership and deeper commercial ties between the United States and Japan. Uh, if we engage in constructive discussion like this one today, uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Mizuguchi, for a, a concise, uh, uh, clear, and uh, thoughtful presentation. Uh, uh, you have presented uh, uh, lots of, provided uh, uh, lots of food for thought. So thank you very much. We go to uh, uh, NEC uh, of, uh, uh, by Mr. Takahashi. Yes, uh, Akimoto-san, thank you very much. Uh, this is Shin Takahashi representing NEC Corporation in Washington, D.C. I wonder if some of you have seen our corporate logo in Capital One Arena. As you can see in my virtual background, we are one of the sponsors for Washington Wizards. Wizards will play in play an important playing game against Indiana Pacers in DC tonight. So uh, I hope everyone support them. The game will start at 8 p.m. All right, let's get into the business. Um, next page. NEC is a global technology company with 28 billion in annual revenue and more than 110,000 employees worldwide. NEC uh, had a, has had a presence in the United States since 1963. Our North American headquarters is in Irving, Texas. Since the founding of the company in 1899, NEC has continued um, to invest in R&D and its technologies have helped telecommunications infrastructure evolve from switching system to the first generation of analog wireless system and now toward 5G. NEC also provides a wide range of other technologies, including undersea cables, space technology, advanced unified telecommunications, and AI technologies like biometric solutions. Next page, please. Since the 1970s, we have been researching and developing biometrics technologies. We developed our first fingerprinting fingerprint system in the 1980s. We developed, uh, deployed our first facial recognition system in the mid 2000s. Over the past two decades, our strong commitment to R&D has helped us earn the top performing spot in NIST test for fingerprint, iris, and facial recognition. By the way, NIST is a National Institute of Standards and Technology of the US Department of Commerce. NIST test has also demonstrated that our facial recognition algorithm is highly accurate across demographic groups. Most specifically, NIST's demographic specific report found that NEC's algorithm had undetectable error rate differentials across demographic groups. In the aviation space, Hawaii Department of Transportation uses NEC face imaging technologies in conjunction with thermal scanning to promote safe travel during the pandemic. In our work with STAR Alliance, we help develop the STAR Biometrics Hub, which allows travelers to opt in to using facial recognition to authenticate their identity via mobile app. At several US airports, CBP is using NEC's matching algorithm. Additionally, TSA launched a successful pilot that integrated uh, CBP's using NEC's, mat, uh, I'm sorry, C CBP's matching service 
into a TSA checkpoint. Delta Airlines used NEC technology to launch the first fully biometric terminal in the United States at Atlanta International Airport, Terminal F. Delta has since expanded to Atlanta Terminal E, JFK, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, Detroit, Seattle, LAX, Orlando, and Boston. At the US Soccer Hall of Fame in Texas, facial recognition helped give visitors who opt in a custom tailored museum tour. At Nanki Shirahama Resort in Japan, facial recognition technology helped facilitate keyless payment and access to hotel rooms and resort facilities. NEC has partnered with NGOs and governments around the world to leverage our technology in ways that help solve, solve social problems. At the biometrics market, uh, I'm sorry, as the biometrics market continue to expand throughout the United States and around the world, ongoing efforts to promote ethical use of biometrics and to strengthen public trust in biometrics technologies will remain vital to fully realizing the many benefits this technology can produce. We are committed to positively contributing to these efforts. Next page, please. With regards to privacy, which Midong-san also mentioned, more, more specifically, NEC's commitment to privacy is grounded in our broader commitment to human rights. Across all of our business areas, we are committed to developing and deploying solutions in a manner that upholds our AI and human rights principles. In our biometrics business, for example, we work to ensure that our solutions are reliable, secure, and accurate overall and across demographic groups. Our approach to product design includes encryption, diverse algorithm training and testing data sets and other safeguards. We also review potential customers' human rights recall and risk mitigation policies. And we aim to sell only to trusted customers and through trusted partners. After we decide to sell to the customer, we work with the customers to plan deployments, train individuals, who's operating in the biometric systems and provide operators with ongoing support via a customer service helpline or field site visits. So as you know, Mizumi-san discussed, you know, what is needed? So furthermore, we work with policymakers and through industry association to develop gov governance frameworks that simultaneously promote privacy and other civil rights, social justice, safety, security, economic efficiency, and technological innovation. We believe that developing national governance frameworks, as Mizong san also discussed, will play a crucial role in building public trust in biometrics and other AI technologies in the United States. And we support efforts to facilitate global collaboration on privacy and AI ethics governance frameworks that help combat techno authoritarianism and ensure that democratic countries such as the United States and Japan continue to play leading roles in determining, determining how to use cutting edge technologies in a manner that respects human rights worldwide. Next page, please. Now I'd like to shift the gear a little bit and discuss the US-Japan Technology Alliance, which was one of the important topics at the US-Japan summit in April. Leaders of the two nations specifically discussed the collaboration on 5G, which Akimoto-san pointed out. NEC has promoted open architecture approaches of 5G. We have supported NTT Docomo, which realized interoperability between base station equipment from NEC and other vendors with ORAN Alliance compliant interfaces. NEC is also producing ORAN compliant radios for 
Rakuten Mobile, which is now building the fully virtual multi-vendor 5G access network, conforming to ORAN specifications across Japan. As you can see on the screen, NEC is also providing SI services to service providers around the world to help them gain the benefits of open run without having to manage the complexity of integrating man and managing these multi-vendor solutions. For this purpose, NEC is making significant investment in establishing global centers of excellence and interoperability testing. Collaboration between trusted US and Japanese companies critical to create open standards and accelerate 5G innovation and deployment. Here's what's needed. Government supports of both US and Japan are critical to successful deployment of 5G open run in the US and global market. USA Telecommunications Act will play an important role in this, res in this respect. In addition to the Public Wire Supply Chain Innovation Fund, which is currently in the bill of the Endless Frontier Act, which is being discussed you know, this week, um, I, I also firmly believe that the Multilateral Telecommunication Security Fund, the other part of this USA Telecommunication Act, um, but not yet in the bill currently, is also critically important, and I hope it will be somehow appropriated this year. The funds should be used to promote safe and secure networks among the United States partners by cooperating with other federal agencies involved in international aid, including the Export Import Bank, United States Agency for International Development, and the Development Finance Corporation. Okay, the next page, please. Okay, uh, this is not my last page. Um, lastly, I want to share with you our latest public launch of our new company, NEC National Security Systems, NSS, which symbolizes our commitment to ongoing technology partnership with the US government. The launch of this foreign ownership control or influence, um, which is FOCI FOCI mitigated subsidiary under an anticipated special security agreement, SSA, with the US government will allow NEC to provide its world class innovations in a specialized manner to the United States government. NEC has been a long time, time technology partner to government customers in the United States, as I have seen, shown. Um, our co-creation of cutting edge technology solutions with these partners has led to innovative capabilities for the mutual benefit of the US, Japan, and many others around the world. As the US and Japan pledge to further technology collaboration in areas like AI, 5G, quantum computing, and space exploration, NEC is committed to fathering our partnership as a trusted technology provider. The establishment of this NEC national security system is an important step in that journey. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Takahashi, for your uh, insightful, thoughtful, exactly uh, uh, 15 minutes of presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, just as a uh, 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 Mr. Mizabuchi did, uh, uh, you have provided lots of food for uh, uh, thought uh, in the Q&A and discussion. So thank you very much. We're gonna go to uh, uh, Daikin uh, uh, by uh, Ms. Kogure. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm very honored to be here. My name is Misada Kogure and I'm with Daikin U.S. Corporation uh, located in Washington, D.C. today. I would like to give you a brief introduction of Daikin's activities and investments in the United States, the challenge we are tackling in the US and some suggestions to policymakers. Okay, so let me start by introducing Daikin and our activities in the US. Daikin was established in 1924 in Osaka, Japan. 
Dakin is a global leading air conditioning and floor chemical manufacturer. We operate in more than 150 countries now. In the United States, we've been operating for more than 25 years, and we have more than 17,000 employees nationwide as of today. And so far, Daikin has invested more than $7 billion in people in production in North America. We, have, we also have a broad sales network with more than 60,000 dealers and contractors and more than uh, 2,000 distribution locations. Next slide, please. So this map shows the location of Daikin facilities across the country. The biggest facility is located in Houston, Texas as Akimoto-san introduced in the beginning. And we produ produce residential HVAC products in Texas. I will explain more in the next slide. We also have large plans for commercial and industrial HVAC products in Minnesota and Virginia. In Alabama, we have our oldest plant in the US that produces fluorochemical products. We also have a number of R&D facilities those R&D centers are, de are developing products optimized for the US market. Next slide, please. So the Daikin Texas Technology Park, we call it DTTP, opened in 2017 as Daikin's largest US facility and one of the largest manufacturing buildings in America. In fact, as far as we know, um, our facility is the third largest facility in the United States, only after Tesla and Boeing plants. And it's located in Waller, Texas, which is near Houston. Daikin invested $500 million in this facility. And as of today, DTTP employs more than 8,000 individuals. This facility has many functions, including R&D production office, a warehouse and a showroom. And as you can see on the slide, uh, some policy policymakers have visited this facility, including Senator Ted Cruz, Congressman Mike McCall, former DOE Secretary Rick Perry, former Ambassador Sugiyama, etc. Next, please. I would also like to touch upon our social contributions in the United States. So Daikin has a philosophy called people-centered management. Daikin believes that cumulative, cumulative growth of all group members serves as the foundation for the group's development. And we implement various programs to support our employees. For example, we are providing an online learning program with more than 3,000 training courses so employees can improve and develop their skills. We also have specific training programs. For example, we provide a program for service technicians. It's called Service Technician of Excellence Program STEP. We also have hands-on safety training programs for employees working at their plants to ensure their safety. We also have internship programs with local universities to look, uh, educate students that could be our future employees. Uh, we are also supporting local communities because communities are essential for Daikin and on our employees to grow. Each of our facility is actively engaged in programs in arts, education, environment, infrastructure improvement, disaster relief, and diversity. For example, Daikin America Indicator Alabama, a fluorochemical um, plant, holds the Daikin Festival. It's called Bonwadori in Japanese, which is a Japanese traditional summer dancing festival to show gratitude to local residents that always support Daikin and to provide an opportunity to experience the Japanese tradition and culture. We started this festival in 1994 and every year we have more than 20,000 visitors. It is widely known as the most significant Japanese cultural festival in Northern Alabama. We also organize homestay programs for local high school students in Alabama and Texas. Every year, high school students visit Japan and stay at their employees' houses for a couple of weeks. The programs 
are well received as they give an opportunity to high school students to experience a different culture and broaden their horizons. Okay, next, next slide, please. Now, I would like to introduce Daikin's three core environmental technologies. Those technologies have already been widely adopted in countries like Japan and EU, but they are relatively new to the US market. So the first technology is heat pumps. It is a technology to warm water and air by capturing thermal energy from outside air and transport the energy to the indoors by using electricity. Compared to the gas furnace, which is a standard combustion method in the US, the heat pump emits less than half of the CO2. The climate benefit of heat pumps will become even greater as more countries replace fossil fuels with renewable energy. In brothers, Daikin is known for pioneering inverter technology. Inverter enables the HVAC units to regulate the room temperature by adjusting its motor speed. The conventional known inverter model only turns off and on the motor, so it's difficult to control the room temperature. This technology gives comfort to people in the room and also serves, uh, saves energy. As you can see on the graph, it saves 58% of energy consumption compared to the non inverter type air conditioners. The third technology is the refrigerant we use. A refrigerant is a medium for conveying heat in HVAC systems, and hydrofluorocarbons are usually used as refrigerants. Hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, do not deplete the ozone layer, but have high global warming potential. As the only air conditioner manufacturer in the world that also makes refrigerants, Daikin is advocating the use of environmentally friendly refrigerant. Uh, with lower global warming potential. We are specifically advocating the use of R32, an energy efficient, low GWP refrigerant. In 2012, Daikin launched the world's first residential R32 air conditioners. And in 2019, we also announced to adopt R32 in North America in selected products where building codes allow. Next slide, please. With these technologies I mentioned earlier, Daikin develops and produces HVAC equipment for a variety of spaces, residential, commercial, and industrial. I would say Daikin has almost all kinds of HVAC solutions that satisfy customer needs. And we provide both products developed in Japan and products commonly used uh, in the US. Okay, uh, next slide. I would also like to um, explain about our long-term environmental commitment. Daikin announced the Environmental Vision 2050, which is our framework for helping solve environmental issues over the long-term. We will provide safe, healthy air environments while striving to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero through our products, solutions, and the power of air. Okay, the next slide. Lastly, I would also like to discuss our challenges and mission in the US and some suggestions to policymakers. The United States is the world's largest HVAC market and with the second largest HVAC CO2 emissions out only after China. And Daki makes more than 25% of its sales here. So the US market is very, very important to Daikin. And for Daikin that aims for carbon neutrality in 2050, reducing CO2 emissions through operations in this region, the United States is our most important mission. We are committed to reducing CO2 emissions in the HVAC market through the use of core technologies I mentioned, such as heat pump, inverter, and low GWP refrigerants. We believe these technologies will also support the US government to achieve their environmental commitment to reduce CO2 emissions. 
So we are trying to promote products using those technologies to reduce emissions while providing comfort and safety to consumers in the US. In Washington, DC, we are doing advocacy activities to advocate policymakers, environmental NGOs, and other players in the HVAC industry to promote more environmentally friendly products. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, this will be my last slide. So Daikin's request for the US government is to implement policies that help environmental technologies or energy efficient products to be widely accepted and penetrated in the market. Daikin has lots of experiences to promote these technologies worldwide together with the Japanese government. We believe that we could also help the US government to reduce the climate impact with our technologies. We have three specific suggestions. First, we are hoping to see the stronger leadership of the US government in global climate issues. Specifically, Dakin would suggest that the US will ratify the Kigali Agreement under Mon Montreal Protocol to reduce the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, which are powerful greenhouse sources, uh, greenhouse gases, sorry. Although the US Congress already passed a law to implement HFC reduction regulations in a similar manner without ratifying the Kigali Agreement, we believe the ratification is still critical for the US because it'll impose penalties on countries that don't ratify in the future. The second recommendation is promotion of tax incentives for energy efficient products. Daikin supports programs for home and commercial building owners and manufacturers, which are already ex existing. And we are also trying to in, uh, introduce a new tax incentive program for manufacturers of heat pumps and uh, energy efficient products. These will be uh, powerful tools to promote heat pump and inverter technologies. And thirdly, we support trade policies that make companies that are committed to the local production competitive. It is especially important for us to introduce energy efficient products with competitive prices in the United States. Excessive tariffs and restrictions may weaken competitiveness of manufacturers and discourage foreign direct investment. Also tariffs may adversely impact supply chains and inhibit growth. For example, we believe tariffs such as section 232 on steel and aluminum and 301 on Chinese products should be reconsidered as they increase production cost for us. These may incentivize manufacturers to offshore production outside of the US. So um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And again, thank you very much for your attention. And I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for a, a very well organized, uh, a, a very informative uh, a presentation. Daikin has a, a, a lot of uh, a business in Asia, relatively new uh, compared to uh, Hitachi and uh, NEC in the US market, but uh, uh, acquiring a good man, uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, you know, expanding your business in the United States and uh, your presentation uh, uh, casts a light on why uh, you've been uh, so successful. And also, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, many uh, uh, or several uh, active uh, uh, female business leaders uh, uh, from Japan in Washington, and you are certainly one of them. And uh, thank you very much for representing that group. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, to uh, uh, open up uh, uh, Q and A's, uh, um, the first uh, uh, question is from uh, uh, Mr. Mani Manriquez of uh, uh, Japan Automobile Manufacturers Association. Manny, Mr. Manriquez. Thank you very much. Akimoto-san, appreciate it. Um, I'm very impressed with my colleagues' uh, efficiency. I think we're right on the right on the time markers. Very nicely done. Uh, those are great pre presentations. I think we have all, all a lot to learn from each other. Um, I've been given the opportunity just to share a couple of key highlights about the Japanese automakers' presence in the United States. So I'll make a couple points before I ask my question to you all. Um, 
main thing is, you know, I think we have a lot in common, uh, Japanese industry. We have very deep investments in the U.S. Uh, Japanese automakers have more than $53 billion in cumulative investment in the United States. Um, and for several years running, we have actually produced uh, about one third of all the vehicles made in the United States. So that's really, uh, I think, a great achievement for our member companies and also really serves the U.S. auto industry and auto market, really boosting the, the U.S. economy and the competitiveness of the, of the U.S. auto industry. Um, you know, we also really helped to sort of define and open up the alternative powered vehicle market in the U.S. with the introduction of the first alternative powered vehicles in, in the market with the Honda Insight in the 1999 and the Toyota Prius in 2000. Uh, and these days we have a really, you know, established track record in terms of environmental sustainability and stewardship uh, across the country. Um, and I'd say another really key pillar of our presence here is the, you know, automotive in innovation through uh, R&D. We actually have nearly 50 R&D and design centers across the country. Um, and really a key uh, element of that is um, that we have helped to develop centers of excellence around the country um, and really invested a lot. Many of our companies are invested in R&D in Michigan, uh, as well as Ohio, um, and really have helped define the, the sort of environment around design centers in Southern California. Um, so my question for, for you all, I think uh, you know, a couple of you have mentioned centers of excellence, what are some of the regions uh, around the United States that your, you have helped to develop, your companies have helped to develop uh, you know, in terms of presence, investment, and the cutting edge technology that you, uh, you produce and, uh, and develop in those areas? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And perhaps uh, the question is also, uh, what area of the United States are uh, attractive to your uh, business as well? Um, Yes. So, uh, uh, anybody? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try it first. <clears throat> um, so, uh, Shin Takashi from NEC. Uh, thank you, Manny, for a uh, great question. Um, so, our case, uh, as I mentioned, the biometrics technology, um, just give, I'll talk about that as an example. So, the software algorithm of that um, solution comes from Japan. However, all this airport solution that we built, that was built in the States, including all the kiosk hardware and software. And that business headquarters is Sacramento, California. So that's where our center of excellence for this airport biometric solutions. So that's where we built the entire solution. And we are now exporting that solution to uh, European countries and others. Um, you know, the airport solution, I, I, I mentioned the uh, Star, Star Alliance. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, first uh, deployment of that was in Germany. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we so, 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 you know, that's where we built the, uh, uh, um, the center of excellence for biometrics. Also, we do have the similar um, uh, center of excellence activity in our North America headquarter in uh, Texas, um, near da uh, Dallas. That's where we moved our headquarter office from New York to Texas with a lot of you know, uh, good benefits uh, in, in Texas. So we've been enjoying uh, our headquarter operation in Texas for since 2001. And actually I did, I did live there for um, five years too. So um, that, that's a, a great, um, place. Um, and also 5G, uh, we are building a uh, center of excellence in New Jersey, um, Princeton, New Jersey. That's where, you know, th that's where the Bell lab started. That's the kind of heart of a telecommunication technology. So that's, we're kind of going back there to build our new 5G uh, center of excellence. So Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mizuguchi, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, lots of facilities in the United States, but uh, you have a, a major uh, R&D center in Silicon Valley for uh, quite some time. Would you like to uh, uh, talk about it or would you like to, uh, whatever you would like to uh, uh, address uh, uh, Mr. Manrique's question? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we have uh, 17 R&D laboratory in the United States. 
and we have uh, uh, invested 400 million dollars uh, the recent in the recent three years uh, in uh, Rando D. As I mentioned, um, it's one of the strongest reasons why we are here in the United States. We can have a good access to the best talent in the engineering and uh, uh, research. Um, uh, many of the 17 laboratories, each one of them uh, uh, belongs to the e, e, e broader business segment, but the, our flagship laboratory uh, is in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara, uh, which is focusing on the uh, most emerging advanced technologies such as AI, robotics, uh, blockchain, and the new type of the energy. So uh, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, R&D is one of the most critical area uh, we have been and we will be committing uh, in the United States. Um, in terms of the states or regions uh, we operate, we have uh, major facilities in um, around 40 states uh, in the United States. So, so I cannot pick just uh, only a, a couple of uh, the states among them, but uh, I, I, I believe we can um, get a good leverage uh, from the, the such a variety of uh, uh, states. Like uh, our um, industry segment mainly uh, located, uh, based in the uh, uh, Midwest area. And our energy business segments are mainly in located in the southern area. And IT, as you can imagine, are mainly in the West Coast. So uh, uh, depending on the uh, 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 necessity and uh, what you are uh, trying to achieve, uh, we can uh, 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 be based in a uh, variety of uh, uh, states and uh, we can um, enjoy such a diversity of the talent and uh, access to the uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kogure, I know you're there. Uh, would you like to uh, uh, make a comment or uh, do you have sure, a Yes. Daikin's policy is to produce products locally and this comes from the uniqueness of the HVAC products air conditioners, because um, air conditioners, the needs for air conditioners depend on climates of each region. So every region has a different demand or need. So uh, we, are, we are kind of spreading out our production basis and we don't, we don't have any specific preference on any specific area. So we don't prefer one state over another, but um, we, we are, fairly flexible and pick the best optimal place for uh, the production of our products. And, and, but if I were to pick several states, this may be a summary of my presentation, but I would name Texas, uh, Virginia, Minnesota, Alabama, and Kentucky. Those are the main states that we are producing our products. And we have really strong uh, relationships with the community, local communities and local policymakers. So I hope that answers uh, your question. Oh, those are, those are fantastic answers. Thank you. And, and if I can just underscore one point that I think a couple of you made earlier, the stable business environment, you know, based on international rules is really critical to encouraging this kind of ongoing investment. Uh, and th thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Uh, Shanti kindly uh, posted in the chat a link to our, um, our contributions website, which really shows our footprint uh, throughout the United States. So thanks again. Well, thank you very much for your question. I really appreciate it. If I may, uh, uh, one of the uh, major domestic uh, policy issue is uh, infrastructure, as uh, uh, some of you mentioned. From the viewpoint of uh, uh, your company, as well as the point of your Japan uh, uh, Economic Business uh, Corporation, what are the things that uh, uh, you uh, would like uh, the Congress as well as uh, uh, administration to uh, uh, think about uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure? All three of you represent the companies that have a major infrastructure component. Mizabushi-san, you touched on the infrastructure in your presentation, so perhaps uh, uh, you'd like uh -huh. Yes, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, it has been a bipartisan agreement for a long time in the United States. Uh, we should have uh, uh, big investment in the infrastructure. We should 
renew the existing infrastructure, which uh, had been uh, built uh, decades ago. Um, and uh, that's the consensus. Uh, the, 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 but the uh, 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 policy makers need to uh, build a, a consensus, what area, how much, uh, uh, which region they should invest. Then uh, when they do that, uh, uh, our suggestion uh, should be, um, instead of just uh, renewing existing uh, uh, traditional type of the infrastructure, such as highways and railways, uh, they should try to uh, 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 take advantage of the new technologies, which are, are, are widely available in the, in the United States and Japan, uh, namely digitalization. By, by introducing the uh, digitalized technology, advanced technologies, uh, they can make the, the infrastructure uh, more efficient, uh, uh, more environmental friendly, more sustainable. So uh, 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 by working uh, uh, between the uh, private sector and the public sector, uh, United States can um, really uh, uh, build a new generation uh, infrastructure, which should be more competitive and which should be, could be a base of uh, 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 the society uh, to support the, 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 the uh, competition among the, the countries. Um, that, that's what I wanted to... Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Ms. Kogure or uh, Mr. Yeah. Yes, I'm ready. So. Uh, yeah, in order to improve infrastructure, especially HVAC in the infrastructure, I would say that the well-trained uh, personnel is really needed um, because um, HVAC units really need installation and the quality of installation matters uh, a lot. It, it influences like energy efficiency and durability of products. So um, I would like to say that more investment on uh, employee education, I'm sorry, not employee, but um, technician education may be needed to uh, improve the infrastructure. And also it's not uh, directly related to our business, but um, in order to um, transport our products, um, better uh, highways and railways and you know, transportation network is also appreciated. So that, will, that could be another area of, of that has room for improvement in the United States, I, I, I think. Thank you very much, Mr. Takahashi. Okay, a couple areas. One is, you know, airport modernization that, you know, airport, as I mentioned in my presentation, there is one big focus for us to try to contribute with our technology to modernize the operation. Um, so, you know, a couple of areas like safety, security, but also, Custom, you know, travelers experience improvement and that's promote uh, traveling. And uh, there's a lot, lot area, you, you, you know, the Delta Airlines solution that I mentioned, you don't need to show your passport and tickets at all. You can go through uh, check-in, backdrop, TSA, boarding, everything just with the face. So, you know, that's opt-in system. You agree to, to do so, but, uh, you know, by doing so, you know, you can improve your experience uh, dramatically. So these are the, you know, modernization uh, of the, you know, um, airport. And uh, also, you know, AI technology can be used for any places, any infrastructure that, you know, as, um, you know, Congress I mentioned, highway, bridge, you know, how you measure uh, those, you know, uh, where do they need a repair. Uh, there's a lot of AI technology can uh, contribute. And lastly, um, digital infrastructure, 5G, you know, as I also talked about, that is a great, you know, important, uh, very critical area where, you know, the, some of the other nations are already investing, uh, you know, digital infrastructure and then that's critical so, because now the 5G can change the lifestyle and, uh, you know, to have the very, um, you know, solid and secure and diversified, um, network of 5G is, is very, very critical. So um, I think, you know, US government knows that and they are, or, and the Congress, they know that. So there's a lot of discussion and I hope um, that will continue and uh, get actual appropriation uh, going this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry about uh, my ignorance and the uh, lack of homework, but uh, uh, 
I guess a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, you have a wonderful uh, showcase in Virginia, uh, you know, showing a, a ticketless uh, uh, entry system for sports event and things like that. Are you part of a, a Tokyo Olympics? Yes, yes, we are. We are. Uh, so, you know, the athletes, uh, all the staff, uh, volunteers can use the same system that they don't need to show your, their ID. They can just in and out because there are so many venues, you know, Tokyo Olympics. So that would be a, a you know, convenient tool. Great. Well, thank you very much. I have a, a one uh, uh, question, uh, uh, um, which is uh, becoming a hot uh, subject matter uh, since I uttered the word Olympics. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, House Speaker uh, Pelosi uh, uh, testified at the Congress, uh, essentially saying that uh, 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 private sector companies should think twice, uh, or, or in her word, I think she said uh, boycott uh, 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 Winter Olympics in uh, uh, Beijing. Uh, because of human rights uh, violation and so on and so forth. How do uh, uh, geopolitics, human rights, uh, those things come into uh, uh, business uh, decisions uh, uh, globally uh, uh, for Japanese companies? Okay, okay I'll start then. Um, so, you know, I, I did mention in my presentation that uh, this is, you know, particularly, you know, we are involved in AI technology development. And uh, human rights, you know, I mean, AI <laughs> can be used in many different ways. And, and if it can be used wrongly, um, that can really cause a lot of issues. So we are very, very sensitive about that. So we, you know, we created our own discipline and principle about, you know, how the AI and, you know, to protect the human rights. So um, we, we, we believe, um, so we, we even, Today, as you just mentioned, globally, um, you have to look at uh, customers, how they're gonna use it. We, I don't think we can just give the technology. I think we, we need to understand how that technology can, are going to be used by the customer. And, and also we need to, you know, th this is kind of new to us, but you know, we need to check the, the, their record, you know, of how they, our, the, the customers um, uh, are, respecting the human rights and privacy. And, and unfortunately, we are in an era that, you know, uh, I mean, it's, you know, f f usually, you know, we, we should, if customer asks, we should be, you know, we should give everything that that's used to be the norm. But, you know, now I think we need to, you know, kind of screen, particularly in the global marketplace, you have to have all these criteria, how you screen your customer. And uh, I think you have to be uh, brave enough to not to sell the technology if we don't we don't feel comfortable that is used in the right way mm -hmm. and that that's something that we already have our internally uh, as a principle to follow and that uh, we are also work in all the procedures and the rules internally thank you very much it sounds like uh, there is an added layer to uh, uh, the concept of a uh, corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. And uh, uh, obviously, it's reflect on the uh, uh, reputation of Japan as a, as a country. Uh, anything to add, uh, uh, Mr. Kobe? Yes. Um, okay. Hitachi uh, CEO Higashihara san, uh, two years ago, uh, in his mid term management plan, declared uh, our mission, our renewed mission should be. Uh, increasing not only economic value, but uh, also environmental value and the social value. Um, uh, 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 as uh, um, globally, many corporations are, are declaring uh, ESG um, management uh, is uh, uh, widely uh, uh, recognized. And uh, especially social issues, uh, as Akimoto-san mentioned, like a uh, human right issue, uh, uh, is very sensitive, uh, but at the same time, uh, citizens, the people are uh, expecting corporations uh, to, to make uh, their own commitment in uh, social issues too. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as a global company, uh, we, 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 we have an obligation to our stakeholders, customers in each region and employees in the, each region too. So. Uh, uh, we, we do have the uh, um, code of conduct uh, to protect the human mm -hmm. rights uh, and uh, uh, also to uh, uh, follow the 
uh, uh, United Nations guidelines. But the, uh, it's always uh, very difficult to try to have a very simple single answer to such a complex, uh, broad uh, uh, subject, especially under this kind of geopolitical unstable situation. So you have to uh, uh, every time find a, a good plan and action uh, to, to, to uh, each specific issue uh, every time. And you have to, to keep updating uh, your uh, governance structure and your management, your top management needs to, to discuss it uh, 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 almost every week uh, uh, as a top priority of uh, uh, the cooperation the management uh, level uh, decision, decision making procedure. Thank you. It looks like uh, uh, the discussion uh, uh, in Washington is that uh, uh, it is important to uh, talk about it and it's also important to do something about it now concretely. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Kogure, do you have anything to add? Yes. So, uh, so I would like to start by saying that our, our basic policy is to provide comforts to global citizens and reduce global emissions. And we do support SDGs and ESGs. But um, since this is a very sensitive topic, uh, we, we are not taking any specific position on any specific issues like this. Um, for example, uh, China is a very important market for us, just as big as the United States. So uh, we are just doing, um, you know, doing our business in every region, providing um, comfort and, uh, you know, um, nice cool air to everyone. So that, that's, that's all I could say, I, I think. <laughs> yeah, we are getting into the season where we need uh, nice cool air. So uh, <laughs> relying on uh, Daikin, you know. Thank you very much. I have uh, uh, one last question uh, uh, specifically to uh, Mr. Takahashi. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, political and the social uh, environment, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, diversity, uh, uh, equality of uh, 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 people across the line of, uh, uh, you know, racial differences and ethnic differences and things like that. I am uh, uh, not a technology expert, uh, so uh, let me uh, uh, ask uh, Lema a question. There have been uh, uh, some uh, uh, newspaper articles that uh, uh, biometric uh, recognition technology is not uh, uh, accurate uh, uh, for a certain group of uh, uh, people. And uh, uh, that uh, a certain group of people uh, have, uh, tend to have uh, darker skins, you know. Uh, what is a, a technology uh, uh, situation with regard to uh, uh, accuracy of uh, uh, facial recognition, biometric recognition across uh, uh, different uh, 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 races uh, and ethnicity? Thank you for that question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, yes, th th this has been uh, you know, discussed a lot and uh, we take it very seriously on this. Um, so the, there is a fact that uh, based on the level of software algorithm, this, you know, there could be a difference um, between, you know, just a scientifically different, you know, tone of the color um, that can be possible. However, you know, the AI, you know, I mean, the biometrics technology is a, you know, AI, AI technology, which is, you know, machine learning, meaning it's all depends on how you train your algorithm. So, you know, you can always improve your algorithm and the uh, well, important thing is, you know, the, the authorized organization like NIST, the, the Department of Commerce, NIST did the test at the end of 12, 2019. And that was specifically about the, the difference between demographic groups. And uh, they listed all these different uh, uh, companies software and, um, you know, uh, its owner, uh, for us that we are listed the highest accuracy where they said uh, using an easy algorithm uh, that is undetectable. The different difference is undetectable. So that was the NIST um, conclusion. So it all depends on the, the level of uh, quality. So, you know, we are all um, supportive to, you know, have some sort of, you know, um, what you call qualification. If, if you, you know, you have to have certain accuracy, 
for certain use of technology. And so, so you know, I, I think, um, you know, uh, we, you know, try to, and then that's also, you know, how that technology is used too. You know, I think there was a 60 minutes program just last Sunday, and uh, that was about the Detroit case. But, you know, this is all about how that technology is also used. Software itself cannot be the final determination of, you know, uh, who, you know, I, I think always a human has to, to be the final decision maker. You know, the, our algorithm only provide a, you know, the group of photos that could be, you know, but, you know, the final, it, it, the machine, the AI cannot be the final decision maker. That's also important discipline that we all need to follow. Um, right. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, all three speakers. Uh, uh, I have asked uh, 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 Mr. Mizoguchi, uh, Mr. Uh, Takahashi, and uh, Ms. Kogure, uh, specifically because uh, uh, um, you have a, a, you know, energy, knowledge, and capacity to uh, engage in a meaningful conversation. And uh, uh, I got one last question that uh, came in, but uh, we are uh, over the time. So, uh, uh, you know, we're not gonna take up the question, but uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, uh, active uh, uh, discussion. I really appreciate it now, your effort to uh, prepare for the event. And uh, uh, we'd like to uh, uh, continue our discussion in the future. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for everybody to uh, uh, join our event today. Thank you.